many of you know what a depth finder is on a boat? As someone who has spent some time, not as much as I'd like, on a sailboat, one of the things that you have to do when you're making your way out of the channel and into a harbor is to sort of see where you're going so that you don't run aground. And that's where your depth finder is your aid because it sees what you cannot see. And if your instruments work properly, you can make your way, which is always an F, you, you can make your way safely in the harbor in this combination of what you cannot see through your instruments and what you can see above water, guiding your way through. And uh, I must confess to you that sometimes I haven't always paid attention to the instruments. <laughs> and sometimes I've been on boats where others have not always paid attention to the instruments. So it feels, this feels a little visceral. I think about that when I think of the dilemma that Martin Luther faced in the 1500s, and quite honestly, the dilemma that we face in the 21st century. It's the same. And that is this. Here is God. And God is inviting you to come out of the channel into the harbor of his own safety. You don't quite know how to get there. And all you see, you see, in your, your very fragile boat is, I'm here, and the harbor is there, and how, how do I get there? Particularly when the harbor is not always easy to find. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways, my ways, says the Lord. What do I do with that? Does that mean I don't have the capacity to somehow think rightly and to figure out how to get there? If the gap between God's knowledge and my knowing is that vast, because there appears in the prophet of Isaiah to be no, no juncture between God's thoughts and my thoughts, just, just the opposite. I mean, it's, there's this redundancy that happens in the prophetic literature where it's very clear that when there's repetition, God's trying to say, I want you to get this one. I'm not just going to say it once. So if that is in fact the case, how can I seek the Lord while he wills to be found? How can I call upon him when he is near, when I don't have the words and I don't know what to say? and I don't know how to get there. And I must confess to you that on this morning, the gospel lesson out of John doesn't really help me very much because I'm called to abide in him, and if I abide in him, there's wondrous abundance of fruit. Ask what you will, my Father is glorified. Extraordinary promises, but guess what? If I don't buy, abide in the vine, bang, I am cut off and I'm thrown into the fire to be burned. <laughs> But what if I don't know how to abide? Hmm. If that's the harbor, how do I get there? No, something else has to break into the picture, you see. And that analogy is intentional because if you listened to the Romans reading, Paul writes, but now, as if to say something new has broken into the picture. The righteousness of God has been revealed. And it's different, consistent, but different. There has been what one would call objective righteousness. This is what you have to do. But it doesn't answer the dilemma, except I throw myself on mercy, on how to do what is in fact being asked of me. But something else has been expressed now. Not just righteousness revealed, but saving righteousness. An incredibly powerful and heartfelt needed distinction. Only what I see in what is revealed is not a set of commandments but instead an invitation given by the faithfulness of Jesus. His faithfulness. 
inviting me into something that I could not find unless God chose by his faithfulness to reveal it to me. You see, not if there's no other way to get there except by God's invitation. Otherwise, there could be a bridge between God's thoughts and my thoughts. And Isaiah has already let that one out. That can't get, we can't get there from here. Instead, Jesus, by his own coming, by what he reveals of himself, is the invitation. And it is an invitation, in fact, to come to the place of death, to the cross of Christ, where all of what I have tried to do to somehow connect to revealed righteousness is shown for what it is, to quote an earlier part of Romans, filthy rags, can't get there from here. My instruments don't work. Because if you, wanna, if you want the boat analogy to be carried forth to its logical conclusion, it's not that somehow God makes my instruments work. God sees me trying to get there and he is the one who, standing on the end of the pier, chooses to come out and take the line of my boat and safely bring me in, <laughs> knowing that even my capacity to read the instruments isn't as good as it could be. <laughs> That's righteousness revealed. That's saving righteousness. God in action, both inviting me and bringing me, into the place where I come to cling to the cross. And that the instrument that was, in fact, the instrument of shameful death is the place where the curse is broken and where I am relieved of the burden of my efforts. And that now, as someone who is relieved of the burden of my efforts. I now have the newfound freedom to enter in and be taught by God himself. Can you hear this? Be taught by God himself what it means to abide. Otherwise, I don't know, you see. I can't get there. But it is, in fact, the Holy Spirit who reveals himself to we who cling to the nail-scarred hands of Christ and are therefore recipients because he's made the room inside of us to receive that which he so powerfully, freely, and tenderly gives to us. Our temptation is to create other rules of obligation. If you want to be a good Episcopalian, here's what it takes. <laughs> and while custom and protocol in fact matter, it's how we organize ourselves. If they become the object of either acceptance or condemnation, we err just as deeply as the Roman church against which Luther spoke. That's why we can, to quote a scripture not mentioned this morning in Paul, we make allowances for one another because we love each other. That's, that's only possible because of forgiveness freely given. So yes, I'm, I wish Martin Luther, the church was not as such that it needed a Martin Luther, but it did. And it continues to need Luther's to call us to the essence of what it means both for God to give and for us to receive. That no matter what we do with edifice, protocol, custom, we by mercy walk under the very blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.